Kenya has historically had far more Indians than Uganda or any of the other countries of East Africa or Central Africa. Yet even in Kenya, Asians were only 2% of the population at their peak in 1962. There were approximately 177,000 in Kenya at that time, most born in the country, out of a total population of more than 8 million people. Even this relatively small number of Indians in Kenya represented a substantial increase from about 44,000 in 1931, when only about half were born in the colony. But these modest numbers of Indians were no measure of their contemporary or historic importance. Their large role in the modern urban economy was indicated by the fact that they were one-third of the population in the city of Nairobi, where their businesses dominated the main street. Nor was Nairobi unique in its Indian influence. The whole coastal fringe of East African ports was long known for being more representative of the culture of India than of the culture of the interior of their respective African countries. The East Africa Railway that brought the first large-scale migrations of Indians to the African mainland began at the Kenyan port of Mombasa toward the end of the 19th century. At a time when most Africans were unwilling to be wage workers for more than one or two months needed to raise money to pay their taxes and showed little interest in selling their crops in the market, the Indians established a reputation for their relentless work and economic competitiveness. Indians were not only the vast majority of those building the railroad across Kenya to Uganda, they also became almost all the station masters after it was built as well as filling most of the subordinate posts in the colonial bureaucracy. Throughout the British East African territories of Kenya, Uganda, and Zanzibar, Indians filled the government's middle-level jobs as clerks, cashiers, typists, mechanics, carpenters, policemen, and many other subordinate but important positions. In the private sector as well, Indians became the bulk of the skilled and unskilled labor force in Kenya holding such jobs as masons, blacksmiths, tailors, building contractors, and shoemakers. But more than anything else, the Indians became tradesmen, mostly small retailers in the cities, towns, and even remote interior African villages. In many cases, they provided the first slender means of communication with African settlements deep in the bush. One ingredient in the Indian retailer's success was that he was willing to buy and sell in very small lots, such as no European would care to deal in, as a report noted in the 1920s. Because the highland region of western Kenya had a temperate climate especially attractive to Europeans, it was reserved for whites only, and quickly attracted a large influx of European settlers. With them came a growing hostility to the Indians. The Europeans could not compete with the Indians, either in the private or the public sector. Indians in both places simply produced more at lower cost. European cotton ginners could not pay African cotton growers as much as the Indians offered. As a contemporary report stated, the European cannot afford to trade on the small scale and with the small margins on which the Indians subsist, and the African generally is not yet sufficiently advanced to do so. The complete dominance of the Indians in small retailing may be indicated by the fact that it was 1966 before the first African-owned shop was opened on Kenyatta Street in Nairobi. Their narrow profit margin and extreme thriftiness have remained the hallmark of Indian traders. Europeans objected to the Indians in their own self-interest and in the ostensible interest of the Africans. Indians were decried as unfair competition, and it was claimed that the Asiatic takes away all his earnings to his native country. How he could do that and yet have growing business interests in Africa was not explained. European settlers launched increasingly vocal campaigns to keep the Indians out of the Kenyan highlands, out of certain residential areas of the cities, and, if possible, out of Kenya itself altogether. Indians were denounced as mere hucksters and usurers, and white missionaries spoke of the ill effect of the Indians' dealings with Africans. However, Winston Churchill, during a visit to Kenya in the early 20th century, said, It was by Indian labor that the one vital railway on which everything else depends was constructed. It is the Indian banker who supplies perhaps the larger part of the capital yet available for business and enterprise, and to whom the white settlers have not hesitated to recur for financial aid. The Indian was here long before the first British official, 
He may point to as many generations of useful industry on the coast and inland as the white settlers, especially the most recently arrived contingents from South Africa, the loudest against him of all, can count years of residence. Is it possible for any government, with a scrap of respect for honest dealing between man and man, to embark on a policy of deliberately squeezing out the native of India from regions in which he has established himself under every security of public faith? Nevertheless, by and large, European settlers in Kenya succeeded in getting discriminatory laws and policies instituted against the Asians. The Kenyan highlands were reserved for whites. Some sections of some towns were indirectly made purchasable only by Europeans, and there were differences in trial procedures between Europeans and Asians, as well as a banning of Asians from holding certain offices. In the early 20th century, an outbreak of cholera that struck Nairobi led to the burning down of an Indian bazaar there, with extremely unhygienic conditions. A variety of observers, including Indians, reported sharp practices by Indian traders, especially in the early years of dealing with less sophisticated Africans in remote villages. Moreover, most Indians were still poor by European standards, and their jerry-built, unesthetic, and unsanitary urban settlements were an eyesore to the whites. However, these factors had all been present during the earlier years, when Indian immigration was welcomed. What was different now was that the Indians had advanced to the point of being rivals to the Europeans. Indians in their early years were politically apathetic, like most middleman minorities. However, the success of political organization among European settlers in getting the British colonial authorities to grant whites discriminatory privileges in Kenya encouraged the Indians to organize themselves politically as well, to press for equal rights. But these Indian organizations remained largely ineffective until after World War I, by which time increasingly discriminatory policies had aroused more Indians to greater concern and efforts. Indians at this point began also to help the nascent African protest movement in East Africa, providing such organizations as the Young Kikuyu Association with office space, newspaper space in Indian publications, and the use of Indian printing facilities. Half a century later, there would be great Indian resentment at how these African political movements turned against them after achieving national independence. Despite the growing political setback suffered by Indians in Kenya, they continued to advance economically. Increasing numbers began to graduate from the ranks of petty traders to become more substantial businessmen, engaging in sawmilling, building, and manufacturing. Others followed a pattern common among middleman minorities by using their business-based prosperity to educate the next generation in the professions. As in Uganda, the government intervened increasingly in the Kenyan economy under various rationales of fairness or preventing reckless competition, but with the net effect of undermining the positions Indians had achieved in the competition of the marketplace. Business licensing and government marketing facilities were used to reduce the role of Indian middlemen during the 1930s. Transport licensing legislation protected the existing railroad from the growing competition of trucks, in which Indians had long had important interests. The taxation of income was also instituted, again an apparently racially neutral measure, but one which hit Indians harder because they received less government expenditure per capita on many public services, including education. As late as the 1950s, the colonial administration spent $180 a year for the education of each European child, compared to only $65 for each Asian child and five dollars for each African child. With the passing years, the power of the Europeans and the European colonial government was increasingly challenged by rising African nationalism, much of it seconded by Asians, politically, intellectually, and financially. An Indian attorney participated in the legal defense of Jomo Kenyatta, and an Indian businessman supported Kenyatta's daughter while he was in prison. Yet Asians and Africans remained separate, distant, suspicious, and resentful of each other. The economic and social gap between them has always been vast, and with the coming of independence, what the Indians had achieved economically became a prize to be sought politically by Africans. Moreover, both were well aware of this. As in Uganda, the average Asian in Kenya earned several times the income of the average African, 
though less than half the income of Europeans in Kenya. Nevertheless, Asians were more numerous than Europeans, and their jobs and businesses more within striking distance of educated and vocal Africans. Large Indian donations to African political causes were discounted by Africans as bribes with an eye to the future. Indian-African relations were historically formal rather than personal, a customer-seller relationship or an African servant for an Asian employer. The only intimate contact was between Asian men and African concubines, but not the reverse, and intermarriage was virtually out of the question. There were no more than 5,000 people of mixed Asian and African ancestry in all the countries of East Africa put together, even though early generations of Indians were nearly all male, and it is from these times that most Afro-Asians derive. Asians have not been admirers of African culture, African habits, or African appearance. This was not peculiar to Kenya or even to East Africa. Despite the pious public unity of Third World politics, a delegate from India at the famous Bandung Conference of Third World Nations summed up the relations between Asians and Africans to an Indian writer by confiding, We and the Africans couldn't care less for each other. As independence for Kenya approached, Asians began transferring their capital out of the country and continued to do so. Their lack of faith in their future in Kenya was also apparent in their reluctance to acquire Kenyan citizenship. Kenya became independent in 1962 under a constitution, shaped in London, that assured equal rights without distinction of race. Nevertheless, the political pressures for Africanization proved irresistible. While explicit racism was not proclaimed, a crucial distinction between citizen and non-citizen was made in a constitutional amendment added after independence. Only citizens have equal rights, and being born in the country did not make an individual a citizen. As elsewhere in Africa, many Indians were hesitant to acquire local citizenship immediately after independence when their future was uncertain. Later, the restrictions on naturalization made citizenship more difficult to obtain and left many Asians vulnerable to political trends. The Kenyan government confiscated thousands of shops owned by non-citizen Asians, forbade their commercial activities in rural areas, and a government official announced the Asians should go home. However, few Asians were citizens of either India or Pakistan. Kenya was the only home they had known but they had no one to protect their interests. Such foreign pressures as were exerted in their behalf came from Britain, not India, and the British were anxious to avoid being deluged with more Asian refugees. The British government negotiated with Kenya to restrain itself from forcing out too many Asians, and with India to accept 15,000 of the refugees provisionally. More than 90% of these provisional refugees remained in India, however. The example of Uganda's mass expulsions of Indians in 1972 created political pressures in neighboring Kenya to do likewise. Although Kenya did not follow suit, it did pressure more and more Asians to leave. The Asian population of more than 176,000 in Kenya in 1962 was by 1975 reduced to about 25,000. Those remaining were almost all either professionals or skilled workers. The Indian businessman, who had played a large role in building the economy of Kenya, was now driven from it.